Giants president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi, said it himself just a couple of days ago. It's going to be a big offseason for the San Francisco Giants. So what does that mean and what should we expect next? You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thanks for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, as I promised yesterday, we're going to get into the 2022-2023 offseason for the Giants. It is a big one. Don't take my word word for it. Take Farhan Zaidi's word for it. He said to reporters when he was discussing the Wilmer Flores extension, they you know meandered into different topics, including the upcoming offseason. And big picture on this year and what to expect in the offseason, Zaidi said the following. The way this season has gone is not acceptable to any of us. We view ourselves as a team that should be in the playoffs every year at this juncture. We're going to be motivated to look for ways to improve. And then later he went on to say, look, without talking about any specific players, he was asked about Aaron Judge. I've used the word transition a lot the last few years. That's sort of been the state of our roster. We always felt like last offseason and this offseason would be big offseasons for us in terms of shaping the future of the club and what the roster looks like. He continues, it's going to be a big offseason for us. We do have payroll room because we're a big market and we have contracts that are ending this offseason. There will be a lot of good options for us. So this got me thinking, Who? what is the state of the payroll and the roster? Like who's clearing off the books and what does free agency look like? So we've looked at this kind of vaguely from time to time throughout the last couple of months, but I really got into some detail here and looked at what I think is the state of the roster and payroll. I looked at arbitration estimates. I did my own estimates for arbitration raises and all that and came up with an overall number of where I think they stand and how many roster spots they kind of need to fill. So without delay, the way I see it, the Giants have fully guaranteed $73 million to next year's payroll, which is not very much at all. That does not include Carlos Rodon's $22.5 million player option. So technically that is fully guaranteed, but I am just, uh, for the sake of this exercise taking that out because I'm it's almost a certainty the only way that he wouldn't opt out is if there's some kind of serious injury in the last few weeks which is of course possible but hopefully doesn't happen so not including Rodon's 22 and a half million dollar player option uh, the Giants have 73 million dollars guaranteed to next year's team and that includes the buyout on Evan Longoria's club option $13 million club option, $5 million buyout. So that includes the $5 million. And then for arbitration, when you look at something like roster resource on fan graphs, they just show you what's guaranteed. They don't make the arbitration estimates yet. Eventually, MLB trade, room, trade rumors will come out with precise figures for arbitration estimates for all arbitration eligible players, but they haven't they don't do that until the off season. So I took it upon myself to make rough estimates for what are these new salaries through arbitration going to be for the Giants arbitration eligible players? And I came up with the number of 25 million going to, uh, I didn't actually write down here the number of players that, that that's going to, but the arbitration eligible players, I, I have the Giants non-tendering here, are Willie Calhoun, Lamont Wade Jr., Luis Gonzalez. Okay, Gonzalez is not arbitration eligible, but he's out of options. And so I, I had to, non-tender him here to clear a roster spot. And Lewis Brinson, also arbitration eligible. So this is like a very preliminary guess. And just because you non-tender a guy, say Luis Gonzalez, doesn't mean you can't re-sign him to a new minor league contract, for example. But being out of options and not performing all that well, 
as he's been in a deep funk, Gonzalez has. I, 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 it's inconsequential kind of because if you pay him, it's just a league minimum salary. But I think they need to improve, and that's that's a spot they could improve. So it comes out to $98 million going to 15 players in terms of guaranteed money plus arbitration salaries, which are not guaranteed. And the Giants would have to decide that they want to proceed with those players. And that's how you, know, you can non-tender guys. Anyway, $98 million going to 15 players. And then there are pre-arbitration players, and I've got them... I've got them with eight pre-arbitration players, and I can't remember exactly what the league minimum salary is going to be next year, but roughly $700,000. And so uh, I've got Doval, Bart, Estrada, VR, and Wins. Call it Wins or somebody else, just a league minimum salary catcher. Uh, Plus, I said three pre-arbitration bullpen arms. Take your pick of Alex Young, Luis Ortiz, Cole Waits, Junior Marte, Thomas Zapucky, What's his name? Guy who just got option for mouth and off at Gabe Kapler. Zach Littell, of course. So anyway, when all of that is said and done, it's $103.6 million committed to 23 players. And committed is the wrong word. This is like in my thought experiment. I'm committing that much to 23 players, but you could take away one pre-arbitration player and it doesn't make a big difference. Then, okay, 103 102.9 102.9 million to 22 players. This is a rough estimate. These decisions, we'll get into them more in a more detailed way as these deadlines come up in the offseason. But let's just say 22, 23 players, kind of not set, but in this thought experiment, set for 103 ish million dollars. So where does that leave them and what is out there for them? to spend on in free agency. So that is what we're going to get into in just a minute. They may need to bring back Carlos Rodon. So then we would add that salary in and see where they stand then, see who else is out there and what kind of money would they have to spend on these guys, even if they kept their payroll at a number similar to where it's been the last few years, which is around $162 million. So again, we're only at 103 and a half. So we've got some money to spend. So we'll spend that money in just a minute. But first, guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate. That's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever the opportunity arises. Process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part is that it's done online. No more visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. So if you could benefit from the extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Uh, And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Locked On at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code Locked On to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. All right, as promised, we're going to spend the Giants' ownership's money, because this team clearly needs it. They need help. They need to spend some money. And Farhan Zaidi appears to be hinting at that. And so if he goes out and says all this stuff, and they end up having another offseason where they kind of let the top talent slide by, and then they sign a you know, platoon bat to a one-year $6 million deal and call it a day, then we're going to have a lot of ammunition to be extremely critical about that process. But it really does sound like I mean, they, they understand, like he said, this is not a acceptable level of play to anyone and that they feel at this point like they should be in the playoffs each and every year. And so I absolutely agree. And I've been saying ever since it was apparent that this season had gone south, that the front office is to blame. They put too much belief in the roster that performed well last year. In hindsight, very easy to say this. And a lot of people were suspicious of that. 
I tended to think, I mean, I predicted they would win 91 games. So I'm going to end up being very wrong. But I keep saying this before you do a huge victory lap, predicting that they wouldn't do that. What did you predict they would do in 2021? Right. So baseball is hard to predict. And I think their their own projection models had them as a much better team than they ended up being. And so they need to look in the mirror and determine what what went wrong. And clearly, I mean, Mike Petriello, who is a writer for MLB.com, formerly at Fangraphs or at least. Yeah, he contributed for Fangraphs, put out an interesting note this morning about. 33 and over players for the Giants last year versus versus this year. It was something like 20 wins above replacement last year and two this year for age 33 and above players in not the same number of plate appearances, but a significant number of plate appearances this year and last year. And so it was just guys fell off a cliff. These old guys let the old guys play didn't age well, as I said in response to this. So anyway, what can they do? Like I said, they've got $103.5 million to about 22 players, assuming these arbitration and pre-arbitration estimates. So let's just say you want to bring back an ace caliber pitcher, whether it's a Carlos Rodon or a Jacob deGrom or somebody like that. I think it's kind of a given that they're going to want to replace that production because as I've said over and over, they have Rodon and they're not very good. So if you lose him, it's just you have to replace that talent that you are losing and then you still have to get better. And so uh, Rodon has been a very good fit. Someone like DeGrom is going to be a very different contract structure, though. So if it's bringing back Rodon, it would probably be something similar to what Kevin Gosman and Robbie Ray got last offseason, which is in the neighborhood of five years 110 115 million dollars he could possibly do better than that i have my doubts just because of the kind of injury history and risk associated with pitchers it's just i think that that's probably a decent expectation so if you do that you're committing a a little over 22 million dollars a year say but if you sign a degrom it's going to be very different because it would be a shorter term deal given his extreme injury history and he's older And so you could probably get DeGrom, I'm not saying this is cheap or something, but you could get him on like a two or three year deal for maybe like $45 million a year. So the benefit is that it's shorter term, but also you're paying a lot more per year. So it's hard to necessarily, we could just say we could meet in the middle and call it $30 million uh, committed, committed to an ace pitcher. So let's just go with that, whether it's, it's a rough estimate, whether it's a, a Rodon or a DeGrom. You're suddenly at, I don't know, 23, 24 players for $133 million. So you still have $30 million to spend just to get back to the 2022 and 2021 and 2020 pre-COVID payrolls for the Giants. So hopefully they don't treat that as some kind of limit and that they are willing to go past it. I think the comment by Zaidi, it's going to be, uh, wait, when he said, we do have payroll room because we're a big market and we have contracts that are ending this season, this off season. So I want to see that payroll go up. And this is an off season to do it, certainly, given that they need to supplement this team from the outside, it would appear. So I don't know. Let's call it actually, I want to say Rodon. And so it's $22 million per year over five years, say. And then you're at 125 million to 24 players and you've still got 40 million to go so you could sign a couple of 20 million dollar players to round that out or you could sign a 30 million dollar player and a 10 million dollar player or you could blow past your 162 and push it up to 180 and then you've got a ton more room on top of that so in terms of the talent that's out there i made a list because they've been pretty clear about their desire to get younger and more athletic, and it's pretty obvious that they need to do so. And so I looked at all these impending free agents and spent a lot of time kind of looking at how have they produced in the last few years, what is their current sprint speed, what is their outs above average, to kind of try to pinpoint some of the more athletic players who would help solve a lot of the issues on the Giants. So I actually just wanted to look at kind of impact talent mostly. So the number one guy who stands out from an impact talent perspective is, unsurprisingly, Aaron Judge. 
who has averaged 7.2 fan graphs wins above replacement per 600 plate appearances the last three seasons combined. And during that span, since 2020, Judge has a 174 weighted runs created plus, which is just absurd. And everybody else that we're looking at here, the next closest on the list is at 142. So Judge is just miles ahead. This year he's over 200, so that's kind of skewing it. But hey, not going to complain about the most recent season skewing the data in an extremely positive direction. So he's done this over 1,358 plate appearances the last three years. The one kind of knock on him is that he is going to be 31 next year. His age 31 season is next year. And his sprint speed this year, just 49th percentile. So an average runner at this point, he used to be faster than that, as tends to happen as you get older, as you slow down. And 62nd percentile outs above average. He does play a lot of center field. He's historically been a good defender. So look, Aaron Judge is probably going to take like $35 million a year over some number of years, six, seven years maybe more than that, given the season that he's having. So he's out there, Bay Area kid. We've talked about him a lot. The Giants could absolutely afford to sign him and still have a reasonable payroll. It's not like signing an Aaron Judge is just impossible because they have some kind of limit and this would push them past it. They could do it and not be past this modest 160 ish million dollars. But I think they're going to have to blow past 162 by, I don't know, even if it's just 180, I think that would make a big difference. But the next guy for me, who more so even hits on that athleticism element and uh, speed and durability that the Giants just haven't had is Trey Turner. So Turner, of course, with the Los Angeles Dodgers right now, in the last three years, his fan graphs wore per 600 plate appearances, which is a, like a full season's worth of plate appearances, roughly. So that's why we go per 600, because sometimes guys get hurt and you want to kind of see what is the production when they're on the field. And for him, it's six war per 600 plate appearances. Judge at 7.2. So it's not as big as of a gap as you might think. And the contract, Judge might end up getting close to double the money. I mean, probably not. But Trey Turner, I think in this market, just strikes me as a little bit underrated and judges market is understandably going to be extremely hot. And so I'm not saying look for ways to save money, but I am saying you could get an elite talent in Trey Turner for arguably a more reasonable price. Like let's just say the Yankees go ham and just spend what it takes to bring back Aaron judge. And then he's off the board. Well, I don't think Trey Turner is a very bad secondary plan there. So he's averaged a hundred uh, weighted runs created plus of 142 over the last three seasons in 1530 plate appearances. So that's almost 200 more plate appearances than Judge. Turner has been a more durable player in his career. This year, Aaron Judge is healthy, but he has missed time over the course of his career with injuries. And given his size, I have said this over and over, I do worry about him potentially being more injury prone as he gets older. I don't know. I'm not a health and biomechanics expert, but I just intuitively worry about that a little bit, given he's what, 6'8", and like almost 300 pounds. I'm just estimating. I don't actually know how much he weighs, but he's a big, big guy. But for Trey Turner, the sprint speed is what really, really stands out to me. A hundredth percentile. He's still one of the very fastest players in the game. He's played short, he played second with the Dodgers last year when they acquired him last year, short this year when Corey Seager left. Earlier in his career, he's played in the outfield with the Nationals. And so I don't know if he's open to kind of moving around the diamond. I don't know if the Giants would just supplant Brandon Crawford at short, even though he's signed for next year. But Trey Turner absolutely would give the Giants something they just don't have right now, which is that elite speed and athleticism. Outs above average has Trey Turner as 16th percentile. I'm not sure I'd buy that. I'd, it would have been better to look at these like over a three-year span. I don't really like looking at these defensive metrics in just one season and then calling it gospel. Sprint speed, yes, because it's measuring how fast you sprint. And that's not really something you need a ton of data to determine. But these defensive metrics are not perfect in one season samples. 
So, I mean, look, I think Trey Turner, if he declines at short, could be a very, very good second baseman, especially with these new rules limiting shifts because range is a big deal and he's got more range than anybody because he's so fast. So I would love to see Trey Turner. He's going to be entering his age 30 season in 2023, but man, he would be a great fit for the Giants. So coming up in just a minute, we've got five other names here that stood out to me as I went through position player free agents for the Giants to add now that we've added our Rodon and seen where we are there. So coming up in just a minute, we'll get to those five and what their qualities are and how they would help the Giants. But first. All right, as promised, we are going to look at these five remaining players. I've just sorted them in terms of war per 600 plate appearances, just simply by looking at essentially who has been the best players when they've been on the field the last three seasons. And number three here, after Judge and Turner, Trey Turner, is Xander Bogarts, who is a true shortstop in a sense, I guess, because he's only ever played shortstop, but uh, has historically not been the best defender at short. He's he's done very well this year. This is one of those things where the last few years haven't been great, but this year looks great, and so I kind of tend to skew towards averaging the three years as opposed to putting all the stock into this year. But... For Bogarts, he's averaged 5.2 Fangraphs wins above replacement per 600 plate appearances the last three seasons. He's averaged a 134 weighted runs created plus. He's done this in 1,394 plate appearances, so not quite as regular plate appearances as Trey Turner, but I would imagine Trey Turner is one of the leaders in the game over that span. He just And the Dodgers lineup is so good, it turns over a lot. And so Bogarts has been good mostly healthy, and just a very quality hitter. They do things in different ways, and Bogarts, for me, it was a little surprising. He rates as 69th percentile sprint speed, and like I said, 91st percentile outs above average. From afar, not watching the Red Sox a ton, I didn't really think of him as as the most athletic or fast guy, but he still rates as a plus runner and has been good defensively. But I'm not sure he's a guy you're going to want to sign long-term to just definitely stick at short. So you've got to think about other positions, maybe second base, I think makes a lot of sense for a guy like Bogarts, but he could be a great fit for this Giants team. He's somehow kind of an underrated player, at least maybe on this coast. I think in on the East Coast, they recognize the talent of Xander Bogarts. He does have an opt-out, so he's not a true free agent, but it's a three-year, $60 million dollar opt out like he can opt out of three years 60 million which is kind of a no-brainer I think that he can do way better in free agency but say you miss out on judge you miss out on Turner I wouldn't I it's not a huge step backwards to sign as Andrew Bogarts it would be a step backwards but he's still a very quality player and I would love to see him on the Giants I'm going to skip over Carlos Correa for now he fits onto here but I just I just I don't know that they are a match in terms of the personality of Correa, kind of a conceited guy, maybe. Maybe that's just a perception. Maybe it's the whole Astros thing. I don't know. We'll we'll get to him if we have time. But the guy who stands out to me, as I've said his name a lot in the last few months, talking about the upcoming free agent class, is Brandon Nimmo. So per 600 plate appearances, he's averaged 4.6 fan graphs wins above replacement since 2020. League average, by the way, per for you know for a full season of an everyday player is around two so these guys everybody i'm mentioning is an impact player and nimmo i mean he doesn't do it and he's not a star he's not gonna hit you 60 home runs like aaron judge is this year but just a quality at bat and a quality player and he kind of fits the mold of what the giants like a lot of plate discipline a lot of walks and To me, I didn't even quite realize this, but an underrated runner and outfielder. Sprint speed has him 86th percentile, outs above average 94th percentile. Uh, 134 weighted runs created plus since 2020 in 1,211 plate appearances. So I don't know exactly what's limited his playing time. He does not have strong platoon splits. He's been able to hit lefties and righties. He is a left-handed outfielder. And... It may be that he's dealt with quite a few injuries. I'd have to dig a little bit deeper into why the playing time is lower than almost anybody else on this list. There's one player who comes in lower. 
but I think that you could sign a Brandon Nimmo for a more modest contract, something like four years, $80 million. And so there's your, you know, 20 million a year to Nimmo and then your 35 to Judge or 33 to Turner. I don't know exactly what Trey Turner is going to command, but you can do this and there's 50 something million dollars, you know, 53, let's just say 55. And then you add that to the 103 that we started with. And so we're at 160. And then you add your Carlos Rodon and you're at 180. And then call it a day. You've signed Aaron Judge and Brandon Nimmo. And you've brought back Carlos Rodon. So it's arguable that that is not even enough. Maybe you still need to bring back a Jock Peterson. Maybe you think that that helps you. Uh, when I was looking at Peterson for the sake of this list, it stood out to me that his sprint speed and outs above average sprint speed 20th percentile second percentile outs above average so when we're looking at younger and more athletic i don't know and farhan zaidi also in this interview uh talked about basically in regards to peterson he said we've expressed interest there's still some time till the end of the season and free agency hits and then longoria who said on sunday night baseball when he was mic'd up that he would definitely want to come back if the giants picked up his option Farhan Zaidi said it was encouraging because I haven't heard of him speaking of his desire to play next year in those relatively certain terms. Now we know that. So I don't know. There's kind of this mixed messaging going on where it's like, yes, we're motivated to get better and we need to get younger and more athletic. And then there's like, yeah, we have interest in Belt. We have interest in Longoria. We have interest in Peterson. They bring back Flores. So at a certain point, you've got to rip off the Band-Aid and say we can't bring these guys back. If, like I said, they, I already found them committing to like 23 players. So if you, And that wasn't including Longoria. It wasn't including Peterson. Certainly wasn't including Belt. But if you bring back all three, that's 26 guys. And so it just doesn't work. They need to cut ties with probably, I mean, at least two of them. At least maybe Belt and Longoria. And you could bring back Peterson, I guess. But then you really need to make an impact with these other signings that hopefully they make. So the other players were Dansby Swanson, Gene Segura, and Carlos Correa. Swanson, 100th percentile outs above average, 81st percentile sprint speed, slightly above average bat, but just an impact player because of his athleticism. So I thought that that made some sense there, but he's a true shortstop. And I'm not sure someone they can't at least temporarily move off short. I don't know. Brandon Crawford has not had a very good defensive season. So maybe they do want a true shortstop. So he's out there, Swanson. Gene Segura is kind of more of a bargain player, but quietly a quality player. Not a great runner necessarily, but a solid defender, can play short, second, and third, and has been an above average bat pretty consistently in the last several years of his career. So anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen today. Now make your second listen to Locked on MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked on MLB, on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thanks in advance, and thank you to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants. 